Well, good morning and welcome to Southside Bible Church. We've been holding a conference here at the church, No Beyond, and we've been looking at cross-cultural ministry here uh, in our backyard, and it's, it's been a, a sweet blessing, and I want to thank you to all who participated and served and just grateful for your service to the King of Kings. So I've been asked to close the conference up, and I was called to remind us of the Great Commission that our King, Jesus Christ, has left for us. In Matthew 28, 18, after the resurrection, Jesus declared, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Then in Acts 1.8, right before the ascension, Jesus said to his apostles, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. And this conference has been focused then on Jerusalem, our area that we, we do this thing called life. Our Jerusalem, as I've been praying fervently, that our love and action for this area would increase, and we would reach the lost in our community that need the gospel of Jesus Christ that we come in contact with in a daily basis. So I would that every heart in this building this morning would be aflame for the gospel, for the spread of this gospel into our Jerusalem that every one of us would respond to the king who's given us this commission as Isaiah did and said, here I am, Lord, send me. And so we've focused on going to the nations and to our own nation and to our own Jerusalem. God, here I am, send me. And I'm asking God that we would be awakened to the fact that our lives are not our own. We have been bought with a price. And we have been called into the service of the king and his commission to make disciples uh, all over this globe is the commission that the king of kings has left to us. I've observed now in 30 years of ministry, those whose hearts have been taken up with Christ and just living to fulfill these orders that have been given to the church, and they, they understand it, and they get it in their hearts, and they're just so joyful and happy, and what a delight to just watch them go. I have a 67-year-old, I believe that's his age, I might have missed it. He, he outruns me for Christ every day, preaching in prisons, nursing homes, discipleship with college and career, makes them dinner, uh, trains them and teaches them how to preach, encourages the saints day in and day out, now praying about going to the mission field to go from field to field to encourage our missionaries. Once plagued with depression, now full of joy and purpose. That's what happens when your eyes get off yourself and you die to Christ and you do his work. I was blessed Friday night to hear a speaker, Don McCurry, 91 years old, walking into a mosque, going in with the love of Christ, loving Muslims and sharing Jesus and being invited into their homes. And he said, our homes are just the refueling station where we go to get ready to go serve the king of kings. And when he got passionate about the gospel, this 91-year-old had more power than I've ever seen. And it's just glorious to watch and see. But on the other hand, there are those who have really never entered in to the commission that Jesus Christ has given to us. And you struggle. And you just don't ever seem to get any traction in your Christian life. And you tend to criticize those who are trying. You grumble, you complain in their service. You're always frustrated that everyone's not doing it right just not entering into the joy of your master. And my prayer this morning is that every one of us would take hold of this commission and see how we all fit into our gifts and our part to start working for King Jesus for this season in redemptive history of the ingathering of the nations. So what a privilege that we have. 
This morning, I want to take a different route than I have with the, the last two conferences that we've had here. Uh, Acts 1.8, we looked at uh, last year. The year before, we looked at 2 Corinthians 5.18 through 21, what Ray just read. But I want to try and get more. I've just been praying on this. What are the motivations and desires? Rodney and I laugh how we always kind of interlink, and sure enough, we did it again. <laughs> how do we get at our motivations and de de desires that will get us off our couches and get us into our Jerusalem, who just happens to be the nations that are now right in our very backyard? How do we go from couch potatoes to doing what God has gifted and called us to do? How do we get there? And that's what we're going to look at this morning now is really the, the motivation unto all that you've heard at this conference and I want to go before God and ask him to do what no man can do. Father, we do come before you and we've heard beautiful things. We see that the harvest is white and plentiful. Send workers into the harvest. And God, let it begin with me. God, I'm praying now that what we're going to look at, that your spirit would come and attend your word and it would awaken every drowsy heart to the Great Commission, and that it will stir on to greater love and fervency those who are given themselves to this. God, we've been called into something bigger than ourselves. We have been called into your plan and your purpose and where you're taking all things. And so, Lord, I pray that every one of us would see our calling and our responsibility and that, that I don't want it just coming out of the king said it, so I do it. I want it to come out of the glorious motivations that you've given to us in these scriptures. And so God, let no heart be untouched by the beauty of this word and what you have given to us in Christ Jesus. So Lord, do what only you can do. Work through word into the mind, bring it into hearts, and change wills this morning, I pray for your glory. Amen. Your outline this morning is we're going to look at Romans. If you'll turn to chapter 1 and start looking at gospel, you need to go to Romans. Romans 1. And we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 18. So Paul writes in Romans 1, 14, I'm under obligation <clears throat> both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who are suppressing the truth of unrighteousness, the truth that creation tells us there's a God and he must be worshipped and served. And we suppress it in our unrighteousness. And so let's Ask God to bless this word. Father, I thank you for what Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit and what he's captured in these verses. I pray now, illuminate them to the minds and hearts of your people. Amen. The outline then is we're going to look at five aspects to this commission. And the first thing is we must have a correct motivation. That's where I'm going. Secondly, he tells us we have to have a correct method. You need to preach the gospel. And then you need a correct mark. His aim, his target is you who are in Rome. And then you need a correct mindset that the gospel is the power of God. And then you need the correct message that in it the righteousness of God is revealed. And so I want to look at those five aspects and, and, and I just see them like a bunch of bombs ready to go off. And if you understand each one, what it should produce is those who are given to this mission commission that God has given to us. And so we need every one of them to go off in our heart. And if you're apathetic and cold and dead to the lost and to this commission, maybe some of these bombs are just sitting in your heart and they've never gone off. And I feel my calling this morning is to try to light them. And I've been asking the Holy Spirit, just put a torch to a couple of these bombs just sitting there that have never gone off in your affections and in your heart. 
And so God, would you light bombs this morning? Start with a correct motivation. A correct motivation. I'm going to go back to Romans 1, 5, if you'll look with me. <clears throat> Paul says I, I, the gospel here that it's been from the Old Testament now through whom we've received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles. Why, Paul? For his name's sake also. And so I want to go and preach the gospel to all the Gentiles and spread this message for the namesake of God. I want the glory of God put on display as a saving God and who he is. So there's a, a passion within me that wants to see God worshiped and loved and adored all the nations to quit worshiping idols and themselves and wrong things. And I just want everyone to worship and adore this God. There's a motive within every heart you should have. I want God glorified. I'm tired of looking at the nations and going out from my day-to-day -day life and seeing people who hate God and suppress the truth and want nothing to do with them. I, I just want to see people become worshipers of this God who is worthy of all worship. That is a motivation that is within my heart that grows daily. Next motivation in verse 6 among whom also you are the called of Jesus Christ. You were dead spiritual corpses and you would have never responded to this gospel. And God gave you life. He caused you to be born again to a living hope. He called you into this gospel, into himself, into relationship. And so one of my motivations is, is that I've been called into this gospel. I've been called into this kingdom and I've been called into this work for God. Verse 7. To all who are beloved of God in Rome. One of my motivations is that I sit here this morning aware of who I am and I'm loved by God. And if that doesn't constrain you, there's something missing. <laughs> that bomb needs to go off this morning. I'm loved by God. That takes away all fear, it drives it out, and it starts to cause a missionary gospel zeal within my heart. There's the God of the universe loves me. Come to verse 18, for, here's the gospel, here's what it is, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. This is a huge motivation. I just want you to hear this, they're not just people, okay? They're not just talking heads. They're image bearers of God and they're fallen. And by nature, they're sinners, and the wrath of God is on them. The wrath of God, the displeasure of God is upon them. Romans 2.4, he says later in the next chapter that they're storing up wrath every day. It's just every day you just keep sinning against this God, and it's just growing and getting more and more, and his power is holding back his wrath until the day that he's appointed to pour it out on mankind who have rejected the gospel in Jesus Christ. And so they're, they're just growing up bigger and bigger, larger amounts of wrath on a daily basis. They walk by you every day, and wrath is growing to the appointed day, and you can't just walk by and ignore that. It's going to be unleashed in an eternal wave after wave after wave of torment. And the Bible says it will never end. It won't ever stop. What have we done to God's message? I think we've become ashamed of it. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of it. The part of Jesus dying, you will get ridiculed. But you talk about the wrath of God, and it brings intense hatred, and it brings increased persecution. That's a message that's contrary to our whole tolerant country and world. It's a message that God is not ashamed of. And he says we should not be ashamed of it. Paul was not ashamed of God's wrath. If it's a perfection of our God, it's a right response to sin. It's a right response to his glory being despised and rejected on a daily basis. It's right response to his mercy being scorned and his justice being violated on a daily basis. This is a right response. And we need to understand it if we're ever going to understand the great mercy of God. But we need to keep it in the forefront if we are to ever have an urgency and a motivation for our neighbors and our community to avoid this end. Have we lost 
this reality in our own thinking and hearts. James Boyce said, today's preaching is deficient at many points, but there's no point at which it is more evidently inadequate and even explicitly contrary to the teachings of the New Testament than its neglect of the wrath of God. God's wrath is a dominant Bible teaching in the point in Romans at which Paul begins his formal exposition of the gospel and will spend three chapters making sure you understand it before he gets to the remedy. There's a temptation to shrink back from this revelation of God. It's his righteous response to sin and rejection of his gospel offer. To share what might not be so offensive with people. But God is not embarrassed about his wrath. It's not some out of control anger as all we've ever known. But it is settled, it's purposeful, it's a righteous response against all the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And so my burden for this city and this world is there's a God who's rightly angry against their sin. And they mock it. And they ignore it. And they act like it doesn't exist. I choose not to believe in it. It's storing up every day until that last day when it's going to be unleashed forever. And that needs to weigh heavier on our hearts while we eat donuts and drink our coffee and just ignore them as they walk by. Lock up in our houses and stay out of their lives because they're bad people. That's got to be set free in our hearts this morning. I pray that no one will live so selfishly to let people with that kind of wrath abiding on them and hanging over them and just care more about the way they're dressed than this reality. One last motivation, and I'll move to my next point. Look with me in verse 14 of chapter 1. Paul says, I'm under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians and both to the wise and to the foolish to what? To preach the gospel. So Paul's saying now this Greek word, it, it means debtor. So Paul now says, I'm a debtor to all men. Well, Paul, what is the debt? What, what does Paul have to pay the Greeks and the barbarians? What's his debt to these people? And the answer in verse 15 is preach the gospel. That's my debt. Well, how do you get into such debt, Paul? Where, where'd you get into debt with them? Well, in verse 5, he says, we received grace. I, I received, I was going to kill Christians, and God stops me on the road, and he reveals himself. So he comes after me, he hunts me down, free sovereign grace, chose the worst of the worst, and I now am a debtor because I received grace. Paul is stunned that he's received the grace of God. He cannot get over. I was killing the Christians. How did I get grace? How does that, how does receiving grace create debtors? God's grace being poured out on a man. Are, are, are we all debtors? Or is this just for Paul? And if you look at verse 14 again, Paul is a debtor to who? To people. Paul is not a debtor to God. So how do you get in debt with people? Well, you, you borrow money, you get a house or a car, and now I'm indebted to a credit card or something like that. I borrow from you and now I owe you a debt. But the barbarians and the Greeks didn't loan Paul anything. He hasn't even met most of them. How did he become a debtor? Well, verse 5, he received something freely from God. You don't become a debtor when grace comes into your life to God. Grace does not make you a debtor in the rest of your life as you're trying to pay back grace. In Matthew 18, you have the 10,000 talents that the one man owed, and he says, I'll pay you back. And he didn't understand grace, and he goes and he shakes the man who owed him just a few denarii. What, what, what he did, he, he, he owed the other guy very little, he didn't understand grace. And he just couldn't get it. But when you understand grace, I'm not going to spend the rest of my life trying to pay back grace. At Christmas, my wife gave me this really nice sweatshirt. And I didn't pull out $40 and say, here, honey, let me, let me give you 40 bucks to pay for that. That's stupid, right? Right? 
So you don't do that. And it was grace. She gave me a gift. And when someone gives you a gift, I don't owe you $40 and now I'm going to pay you for the sweatshirt. That's, you're understanding grace all wrong. Grace is not a mortgage. You don't go into debt with God. The debt has been forgiven. I want you to hear this. Grace pays debts. It doesn't incur them. It paid it. And if you see uh, uh, this as a debt now, you nullify the grace of God. If you're sitting here and your whole life is trying to pay back the grace of God, you don't understand grace. Paul is not a debtor to God, but he's a debtor to barbarians and Greeks and the wise and the foolish. Paul was a debtor then, catch this, to those who needed grace like he did. I needed grace. I didn't deserve it. God freely gave it upon me, and now I have a debt to tell others of the free grace of God. And he was going to kill Christians, and he was graced. And now I'm a debtor to all of those who are graceless. I owe a debt to everyone who's not under the grace of God. I received it freely. I give it freely. So my debt isn't to God to pay back grace. My debt is to everyone that I come in contact with. I have a debt to tell them of the grace of God. And I tried to come up with a new illustration, and I'm terrible at these. My wife's a theater major, and I asked her, could you come up with something better than this? And you didn't. <laughs> so you're stuck with the accountant who, who gets stuck on his same illustrations. I'm on a 20-story building, and the thing is burning, and it's, it's, it's on fire, and I'm up there on the 20th floor with 100 people, and it's sure to go all the way up and burn us, and we would die. And someone yells to me, hey, there's an emergency escape around the corner, and if I run and get on that escape and get off and just run and say, thank you, Jesus, this is great, grace, and then the other 99 just stay on that building and I run off and just leave them there, you don't understand grace. And Paul is saying, I was under the wrath of God, stirring it up every day with my self-righteousness. And God freely gave me grace. I'm a debtor now to tell everyone else how to be delivered from the wrath of God that's upon them. I've got a debt. I can't get rid of that. And I've got to tell others of the grace that I have received from God. Are you letting them just stay in the building and run out? Thank you, Jesus. I got saved. And I don't care about the other 99 or the other billions or nations or different cultures. If you don't look at the others in the calamity and feel a debt to share with them the way of escape, you do not understand the grace of God. That says, I deserve to be saved, and they don't, and that's the end of grace. If you know grace, you were called, and you know it was nothing in you. I ran with 30 guys since first grade, and we were best friends in a little Catholic school, and God called me out in, in college. And so far, no one else, they're still lost in drinking and bars and sex and all these things. Why did he pluck out the worst one of them all? I was shown grace, and you were shown grace. And I want you to hear this, you're a debtor. You're a debtor to tell everyone you can of this amazing grace of God. I can't, buy, I can't walk by people on that burning building and say, what's for dinner? What movie are we gonna watch tonight? You'll walk out of here and you can't lay eyes on another human being, whether cultured or uncultured, and say they don't qualify. Because you didn't qualify, you were less deserving than any of them. And Paul said Greeks were the paradigm of culture. They were the sophisticated, the advanced, the yuppies of our day. The barbarians were less cultured, uncivilized, and foreigners. The wise were educated and the foolish were uneducated. Paul now says it does not matter. 
A to Z, the slum or the sanctuary, it makes no difference. Moral, immoral, there's no difference. I'm a debtor to every walking image bearer of God who's under his wrath. I'm a debtor. There's, there's no more walls. They're broken down. I'm a debtor to every person and human being, and culture and education. I'm a debtor. Your culture, your intelligence, your beauty, your edu- education and your class does not qualify you for grace. Your ignorance, your poverty, how unrefined you are does not disqualify you for grace. There are no qualifications for grace. It's free. And thus we are debtors to everyone who stands in need of the same grace of God. So God grip us with the reality of free sovereign grace that we've received. And that's the death to racism, to self-righteousness, to haughtiness and to unconcern. This is the cure. I had two boys walk up to me on Wednesday night and uh, it's dark in a parking lot and they asked for money for dinner and I was with Stevie and they asked the wrong guys. (laughs) And next thing you know, they spent the night at Stevie's and the gospel's been being poured into them again and again and now a a ministry uh, to those underneath a a, a bypass on the highway uh, will begin And I'm telling you, to watch the way this young man loved these boys is unbelievable. And you just begin to see that this gospel breaks down everything. And instead of judging and looking down, these two boys told us they went to a church and they were pretty much told to get out. And Stevie said, oh, I guarantee you that won't happen here. Don't make him a liar. This gospel breaks down everything. And we're done with just wrong things in our hearts towards other people. And the gospel of grace has just changed everything. And I enter into anywhere and everywhere as a debtor to tell people of the free grace of God. Amen? That was a long point. I better get moving. Correct motivation. I pray you have it. Second is you need a correct method, and we're going to move through these ones quickly then. Look at verse 15. So for my part, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. It's preaching. The gospel is good news, glad tidings of good things, and it's to be proclaimed, it's to be shared, it's to be told. And so the gospel, hear that, it's good news. It's not good advice. It's not here, uh, th- go do this. Here's some advice for you. Here's go love your neighbor as yourself. It's, it's, it's good news, which means it's what is done. Te telestai, it's finished. So the gospel is telling you what God has done. It's finished, and he's offering it to you as a free gift. All other religions, it's good advice. Go do this. Christianity is good news. It's done for you in the person of Jesus Christ. It's done outside of you to bring you into a relationship with God and to start doing things inside of you as a result. So we then are to share the gospel. And this whole friendship evangelism, yes, we love and we connect, but it's time to start sharing the gospel. It's not an, that's an excuse to just say, I just show people it, okay? They, they need to see it and they need to hear it. And so this is a call that, that we got to share it. We got to proclaim it. We got to tell it. It's not enough to let it be the best kept secret in your heart. So the, the methodology, the, the, the method is we preach the gospel. We tell it. We share it. Romans 10, how are they going to hear without a preacher? There's just too many missionaries spending all of their time on strategy and they never get around to sharing the gospel. We need to be eager to preach the gospel to you. And so you need a right motivation. And the right method is this, this gospel needs to be preached. And then we need to have the correct mark in verse 15. <clears throat> On my part, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Rome is a place filled with Gentiles. It's the ones whom Paul referred to as the dogs. 
the city that was famous for its sin and debauchery and rebellion to God. It's a cosmopolitan city with pagan worship and temple cults. It's the deepest rooted enmity that there's ever been among mankind is Jew and Gentile. This is enmity. And, and they were excluded from the worship of God's people. They're despised in this enmity in their hearts. And now Paul's saying, because of the gospel, I'm eager and I'm desirous to cross cultural and ethnic lines to make the gospel known to this group of people. I want to enter into the world and the nations with this message. That's Paul's heart. Went to Walmart to get cakes a couple weeks ago. Oh, it was uh, the going away uh, uh, party for Brendan McMillan. And I go into Walmart over here, and I saw 15 different nations by the time I got my cakes. I was at my kid's apartment complex a little bit over here, and I saw 10 different ethnic groups while I was in their parking lot. I love it. The nations are right in our midst, and they've come, and we have the opportunity to break down these cultural walls with the love of Christ and as debtors, and to begin to enter in and have no prejudice and love and care. And and we need to enter in and break into our Jerusalem. It's here. The opportunities, the the harvest is, is ripe. Let the gospel open up your hearts. Break down walls and barriers between humans. We recognize no man according to the flesh. We're a debtor to every human being to love and share this gospel brothers and sisters in Christ. And so my question is, has the gospel broken down uh, racism in your heart? Has it broken down looking down on people? Because they're different, no matter what it is, educated or uneducated, whatever, criticizing them, not caring about the, the trials they face, the injustices they face, Entering into their lives as debtors with the gospel of hope. Just a large heart. I I don't want to be like Jonah and and just say, no, I don't want to preach because you're so merciful. Those Ninevites are going to repent and you're going to forgive them. I don't want to go. I need someone greater than Jonah. The next Jonah, Jesus Christ, who came and loved all the nations without a bitterness or or any of that junk that, that Jonah had in his heart. And this gospel now is for all Give me a heart like the greater Jonah. Guys, Paul the Jew was eager to preach the gospel to those who are in Rome, and I just pray that you know something of this. I'm eager. I'm eager to preach to orphans in Kenya. I'm eager. There's just the heart. So you need a correct motivation. The glory of God, he loves you. You're a debtor. All of those things we looked at, you need a correct method as we, we preach. We, we proclaim the gospel. A correct mark to those who are in Rome, I am set to go into those who do not know the gospel, no matter what they're like, what cultures, what kind of people were. I'm I'm just set on it. And then fourthly, we have to have a correct mindset as we do this. And I want to look at it in verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so as as I look out there, and and there's just such a disinterest in these days in the gospel. There's a mockery, there's a rejecting, there's there's just God-hating souls filling up my Jerusalem everywhere I look. It just kind of seems overwhelming to me. I I ask, it it doesn't seem like they want to hear it, does it? (laughs) They're, They're not interested. They're chasing the American dream. Why do I want to bring up Jacob's dream to them? Why why preach this message? I'll tell you why. It's the power of God. That's why I'm going to enter in to this culture and this world is this gospel is the power of God to bring people into salvation. It's not a means or an instrument or a weapon. It is the power of God. It is not just an academic thing. This gospel is a power and it's a, the dunamis of God, a, a dynamo or a dynamite. It's the gospel is the power of God. And what does this power do? Well, he says it's the power to bring you into the realm of salvation. So what I already said, my gospel motivation is the wrath of God is upon this whole Jerusalem. It's upon them. It's sitting on them. 
And so what I need then is something that can take him from being under the wrath of God to being in the grace and mercy and acceptance of God. And I'll tell you, there's nothing on this earth that has the power to do that. And I possess the power of God to take people under the wrath and bring them under his grace and mercy. And there's only one thing that has the power to do that. I love that little preposition, ace. If you took a circle, it means to come right into the middle. So I, I, it's a power to take you out from under the middle of his wrath to bring you right into the middle of God's favor and acceptance. And so as I look out at this world where they're all under his wrath, I'm just sitting there as a debtor with a message that has the power of God to bring him into this sphere and this realm. And I'm more concerned about the score of the Bronco game. Oh, my There's no other power known to man that can do this. The world is throwing everything at it to fix it. Drugs, their addiction, the selfishness, and it has no power. It's getting worse. But we have the power of the God and the gospel to bring mankind into salvation. And so I'm eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Denver. I'm eager. And the unbelief that they will not believe and don't want it They won't change their ways. Once a thug, always a thug. I pray that you would be set free from your unbelief this morning to see the power of God and the gospel and to be unashamed of it and to sow it into every heart possible till God calls you home. Amen? Amen. (laughs) Come on. Thanks, Tim. I knew I could get you excited. Okay, last point, and then I'll let you go home. Correct message. You need a correct message. Correct motivation, correct method, correct mark, and a correct mindset. And it does no good if you don't have the correct message. And verse 17, four. In it, the gospel, (coughs) the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. Paul's gonna spend three chapters to show us that we're not righteous. He begins it, there's none righteous, no, not even one, and he's gonna go unmask the Gentile and the Jew and show you that you are not righteous. Gentiles, you suppress the truth. You know there's a God, God made it evident within you, creation's telling you there's a God, and you gotta suppress it so you can live any way you want. I, I, I don't want to deal with you, God, so I'm going to suppress it. I'm going to push it down so I can just live and be a pagan and go after my own lusts and be my own God. And you Jews, you have the word of God, the law. You're religious. You're moral. But your standard is you sit around judging everyone perfectly by your law, but you don't do what you say. You say don't, commit, don't lust while you're committing adultery. You're doing all of these things, so you're really good, you're religious, and you're moral, you're you're fundamentalists, fundamentalists, and you got all these things going on, and and yet you're missing that the finger you're pointing at everyone else is going to come back to your own bony little heart. And so all your religion is you're hiding behind your religious sayings, your pithy statements, your church attendance, you're hiding from your God as you're suppressing Him. So whether you're immoral or moral or irreligious or religious, you are guilty and you're not righteous before the perfectly righteous God who demands a perfect righteousness. And if you're left to yourself, you will use your heathen lifestyle or your moral superiority to resist God. And some of you are resisting God this very morning by religion. You're resisting God by your immoralities and the things that you're chasing in this world. I'm not good enough for heaven, but I'm surely not bad enough for hell is a lie. You're bad enough for the wrath of God to be on you forever unless you're clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So here's our problem, guys. Our righteousness won't measure up to the divine righteousness of God. To be in God's presence, he wants perfect righteousness. And yours is never going to measure up. It's a, it's a, a filthy rag. It's, it's never going to measure up to who God is. And here's the problem. It's because of that, the wrath of God is upon you. 
The wrath of God is upon you for your ungodliness and unrighteousness. And the bottom line is we need to be saved then from the wrath of God. And the gospel is the power of God to rescue us from the wrath. But each one of you need to ask yourself, when you come face to face with this God, and you will, will you be brought through that judgment day or will you be consumed like a little twig being thrown into the midday sun? How does the gospel save sinners? And God wants you to know this. That's why there's books like Romans. Why is the gospel the power of God for salvation? We can all say it's the power of God. Why? If a doctor says we've done everything we can, how long do I have to live? Well, a few weeks. And then you're going to stand before righteous God. And there's going to be a reality. And then you will know, how can this gospel bring me to glory? How does God save sinners? And how does God save believers? Well, look with me in verse 17. For in it, what's it? It is the gospel. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. So why is that good news? L Luther hated it because he, the righteousness of God, he thought, was this something he had to go attain to. So the righteousness of God, here's God, he's perfectly righteous. That's bad news. That, that made Luther sick because the harder I tried, the further I realized I was so far away from that God kind of righteousness. Is that what Romans 1.17 is saying? Well, Luther stayed on it and meditated until it broke forth. And, and what happened is the bomb got lit and it went off. And I, I hope this morning by lingering on this, some bombs will get lit. Because it says this, in it, the righteousness of God. Of God is what's called a subjective genitive. And that means the noun is the genitive of God. And that produces the action. And so it would be translated this way, a God kind of righteousness is revealed in the gospel. So that the righteousness that God requires, who he is, his very person, is given. It's, it's given, it's revealed. And so what is a, a God kind of righteousness? God demands perfect righteousness. The gospel is that God then gives us the righteousness that we need to stand blameless with great joy in his presence. And we, we just can't get there by our own righteousness. If you're sitting here trying to get there by your own doings, you're never going to get there. It'll never happen. And the gospel is that God offers to us what he demands from us, his righteousness. He offers it to every sinner with the wrath of God upon you. To not look to your own hands to fix and clean and bring a remedy but to look to God's remedy. This God kind of righteousness that's revealed to us in the gospel, it's almost too good to believe. Half my ministry is dealing with people who say it's too good to believe. And if God didn't say it in his word, I could never believe this. It's, it's unbelievable. But what I can tell you this, it's a life-changing truth and it's a power. And I've watched it transform life after life. When you understand that God loves you right now as much as he could possibly love, love you no matter what happened yesterday. To finally lay hold that I'm wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. I, I've watched it transform people who were abused by parents. Uh, it's unbelievable what this truth will do. But if you just know the, the head knowledge of the gospel, I've watched it. It's not changing your life. You're still insecure. You won't do the Great Commission. You're just in bondage with some, some facts that you've got in your head. It's a power. And when this power breaks in, it will do what it did for Luther, and it will start a reformation in everyone uh, around you and in your own heart first. Has the power of God broken through? Or are you talkative in Pilgrim's Progress? And you know all the right things and you quote all the right things, but there's no power setting you free from that bondage. It's a righteousness from Christ. Christ uh, came and he, he said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He came and, and he gave perfect righteousness. What God required, he came. So at least he came, whatever the essence of the law required, he fulfilled it. Doesn't mean he did every jot and tittle. There's a million things in that law that some were for females and different things, but the essence of that law 
was to love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus Christ came and gave a full fulfillment and in, in his intrinsic righteousness being God, all of that is being given to you as a gift. When we gaze upon Christ in the gospel and you see his perfect obedience, I want you to see it's yours. When he was baptized and the father said, this is my beloved son and who I am well pleased. I want you to hear that this morning to your own heart. This is my beloved daughter and who I'm well pleased, my beloved son and who I'm well pleased. How could that be? When we see the infinite God born under the law fulfill all of its demands for us, we weep. The righteousness that is revealed in this gospel, guys, it's Christ. It's a divine righteousness. And what God requires, only God could perform. Man can never fulfill the standard of righteousness that God is asking from us. So God then offers this righteousness of Christ then to us freely, apart from any need for us to work on our part. This righteousness is revealed as God's free gift in Christ. And here's what he says, stop striving and rest in him. It's finished. It's done. That's what's gonna set you free when you can finally behold this, to really rest in his atoning sacrifice hanging on a cross for your sin and that you right now are positionally wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ and God looks at you and says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Imputation is taking all the riches of heaven, Christ, putting it into your bank account, Christ's righteousness being given to you and credited to you. And now the one who was wholly unrighteous is perfectly righteous. I'm gonna read a few verses. Just listen to Isaiah 61.10. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He's wrapped me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with garland and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. He wraps me in the robe of righteousness. For not knowing, Romans 10, 3, about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, the Jews, they would not subject themselves to a God kind of righteousness. They, they thought they could climb and get to God kind of righteousness. But Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Perfectly righteous. This very moment before God. I pray we could get that. How do I get that? How do I receive that? Well, faith. It says from faith to faith in Romans 1.17. Ek out of faith, ace unto faith. It's faith from first to last. I could translate it this way, from faith to faith to faith to faith. Faith is nothing more than the empty hand that receives the grace of God. I, I believe this and I put out my hand with nothing of my own, none of my own merit, none of my own works, just a filthy sinner holding it out saying, I believe. And God deposits all of this to your account. This is the most life-transforming truth there is. And I'm telling you, it's a power to change your life, to, to, to watch it again and again when this breaks into a heart is so beautiful. I've just seen mistreated, rejected, abused, not loved, a God who is happy with you and he accepts you this very morning in Christ. It is a power to save you from guilt and to make you pure. It's a, it's a power. Do you know the power or do you nod to these little truths? Has it broke in? Because it's designed to be a power. And when it breaks in, I die and I give myself to this great commission. This is what will happen. My heart, it is a debtor and it's eager to preach the gospel. And my days, every penny I have, all my gifts, everything, I, I am sold and set now to put on display the name that's above every name. If you're just still a, a miser and selfish and, and you just care about nobody, nobody, this gospel hasn't been a power to you. The demons know it and they shudder. And so I'm asking you, has this gospel been the power of God and broken into your heart and set you free to love God and love other people with the days you have? 
Brethren, this righteousness brings us into the realm then of salvation. And guys, I have what this world needs and I'm not ashamed of it. And I'm willing to be shamed by everyone who opposes it and the hopes that this gospel would break into their hearts. And so I'm asking, let's join hands and spread it into every area that we can from our Jerusalem to our Judea and Samaria until the ends of the earth. And so just in closing, next uh, Saturday, the 22nd, here's your application. We have flyers and we're gonna go from neighborhoods and houses and we're gonna go and put these invitations on and talk with people as we go. If you're uncomfortable talking, we've got some of the best trained guys and gals to help you. You can just listen, you can learn, but I, I, I want a group that will show up here that wants to go to our Jerusalem and, and just go and see the power of God in our community. And so I pray that at the close of this conference then that the unity that we have is in this gospel and it's to spread it and it's to make it known and we're to, we're to join hands and stay unified and not be caught up in lesser things and distractions. And so I pray at the end of this conference then that we, we will engage with the king who's given us his commission to take this to every life we can. Let's pray. Father, I do feel uh, a debt. And I pray that every heart in here that's tasted of free sovereign grace would feel this debt towards all of mankind. God, don't let us run from the building and never look back. God, let us try to help as many off this building as possible. God, I thank you that we have such a message we have a message that is your power to take them from that realm of wrath to grace. We stand in grace. God, I pray that every one of our hearts would be burdened and joyfully overwhelmed to proclaim it, that we would, would be willing to be shamed by a world that we wouldn't be accepted by it. We'd be rejected because we are so about telling of our king. God, I pray that every heart, the bomb would go off this morning and they would be unashamed, and they would be eager, and they would be debtors, and they would see that in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. God, I think there's just too many in this church who still don't understand that they are perfectly righteous before you this morning. That's the bomb that needs to go off in some hearts. For when we get that, we know we're loved by God. Uh, it constrains us. And so, Lord, if there's any, one, any heart that needs that to go off this morning by your Holy Spirit, would you light it even now as we pray? God, let it go off. Let them see that the righteousness that you require, you give to empty hands. What could be a better message than that? God, set them free to do nothing instead of trying to merit and earn it. God, give them that freedom even this morning and unite our hearts to die for this gospel. I thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, we do pray, amen.